Okay, well, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Rob Atkinson, I'm president of ITIF. I want to welcome you to an event this morning where we're releasing a fairly major report analyzing uh, what countries, including the United States, are doing to help support their SME manufacturing base, particularly through technology modernization. And uh, we've got a, a great panel this morning. So what I'm going to do is uh, introduce the panel. I'll make a few introductory remarks. Uh, Stephen Nizel is a senior fellow at ITIF who focuses on innovation policy and international uh, competitiveness, trade, and manufacturing questions. He's the co-author uh, with me of a new book we've got coming out next year called The Global Race for Global Innovation Advantage. Prior to that, he started a firm, a consulting firm called Peer Insight, which focused on the practice of innovation in large corporations. And prior to that, he was with NASDAQ. Uh, Drew Greenblatt is uh, the president of Marlin Steel Wire Products. Uh, so we actually have a real manufacturer here. This is not just ethereal policy wonks speculating about the world. Uh, well, well, that is it, too, but uh, have somebody to bring us back to reality. Uh, uh, under his leadership, Marlin Steel has seen four years of record revenue and profit growth, which when you think about the times we're in, that's a pretty uh, uh, amazing accomplishment, and has grown to export to 35 countries, including China, uh, Taiwan, Japan, Singapore, Australia, and New Zealand. And prior to his position at Marlin, uh, Drew was president of Diamond Property, so we're really pleased he can, he can join us today. Uh, next to Drew is Roger Kilmer, who is the director of the NIST Manufacturing Extension Partnership. Uh, most of you know MEP. It's a part of the uh, Department of Commerce. Uh, it's a nationwide network distributed around the country. It's funded uh, in total at $300 million, public-private partnership. Uh, and it works with industry as well as state and local organizations to help provide assistance to our nation's uh, SME manufacturing base. Uh, Roger's been with MEP since 1993, and he's been with NIST, I think, since I was born. Um, no, I'm sorry, that's a 74, not, not 54. I thought it was 54. Uh, he had been MEP deputy director. Let me make a note of that. Uh, make a note of that. Uh, and he was also the deputy chief of the NIST robot division. And also, a little bit like Drew, uh, Rogers actually knows something about this stuff uh, because he has a mechanical engineering degree. Um, both a bachelor's and a master's, so he is actually, he, he really does know the technology as well as the policy. Um, and then finally, uh, Jason uh, Charon, who is joined uh, by the magic of Skype today. So Jason, welcome. Thank you. Uh, and you are in Ottawa today, is that right? That's correct, yes. Wonderful. Uh, so Jason is the executive director of the National Research Council of Canada, the Industrial Research uh, Assistance Program, IRAP. And for those of you who don't know IRAP, it's similar to MEP. It's a very successful program in Canada, again, a nationwide program that works with the Canadian SME manufacturing base. Uh, prior uh, to that position, uh, uh, he was the Director of Corporate Services and Strategic Initiatives at the National Research Council of Canada. Uh, and he, uh, prior to that, was with the uh, Canadian Commercial Corporation and has also had real experience in companies with Nortel Networks and uh, also Xerox. I see he also has a Bachelor of Commerce with Honors in International Management, but he misspelled Honors and he spelled it with an O-U, so <laughs> you might want to fix that on your resume. <laughs> Down here we spell it with no U. Uh, so let me just start by saying, as I was coming in this morning, I was thinking about uh, this issue, and I remember uh, Back in, I'm going to guess, 1991, but I could be wrong. Uh, Cohen and Zeisman wrote a book called Manufacturing Matters. And right around the same time, Dortuzos and several other folks from MIT uh, wrote a book uh, called Made in America. And there was this flurry of insight and interest in manufacturing back then. And it was largely because of the Japanese challenge and the German challenge. And there was a kind of a wake-up call in America to say, wait a minute, manufacturing does matter. Uh, and we seem to have lost that for 20 years. Uh, people began to believe these mythologies that we could somehow thrive as an economy, as a post-industrial economy. Uh, there was a recent leading economic policy person who I won't name who actually said that the decline of U.S. manufacturing is a sign of our health, 
because it means that we're moving into the next big wave of advanced services and innovation and R&D. And the countries with manufacturing, they're the ones that are the lagging countries, we're the advanced country. Uh, this is a little bit like President Reagan saying that the trade deficit means the, that, that America is, is strong because uh, uh, we, we have enough money to buy foreign products. Uh, and, and so I think there's this really, uh, this view in America now that, that's either two views I think that are they're quite troubling. Either this view is that, well, manufacturing has shrunk and it's only 11% of the workforce, so, you know, why bother? Uh, it's not where the action is. Let's focus somewhere else. Or it's this view that manufacturing hasn't shrunk, uh, at least according to some measures of output, and therefore everything's fine, don't worry about it, let's focus on other things. And our view, uh, and what we said in the recent report we did, uh, the case for national manufacturing strategy, is that actually manufacturing has uh, had a significant structural decline in the U.S. We argue that real manufacturing output is down 10% in the last decade. This is counter to the BEA numbers, but I think, I think our analysis is correct. And if you think about the fact that GDP grew 15% in the last decade, it means that we're 25% short of where we should be with U.S. manufacturing output. Now, if you think again, where would the U.S. economy today be if manufacturing real output was 25% greater than what it was in 2000? We would have at least 2 million jobs, if not 2.5 million more jobs. And with a multiplier of three, which is relatively conservative, you're talking eight to nine million more jobs in America. You're essentially talking complete full employment at this point. So I don't think there's a mystery between this. I mean, I mean in a way, it's sort of striking. You have this dynamic here, and then over here, people are going, wow, the economy is in serious trouble. We had the financial collapse. We can't create jobs. I wonder why. And nobody's bothering to connect those two things, that it's this deepest industrial decline in world history. No other country has lost that much manufacturing output in a decade, and yet people are not making that connection. And I think we have to make that connection. And that brings us back to this panel, which is when you look at U.S. manufacturing base, a key component of it is the SME base, the small and medium-sized companies that are both original equipment producers that are selling directly to consumers as well as suppliers in bigger supply chains. And what other countries have realized in a very, very deep way is that their overall manufacturing uh, is important to their country and they cannot have a healthy manufacturing base unless they have a healthy SME base. And that's why, as you'll learn today, what we see is that many other countries are investing an order of magnitude greater than we're investing in helping their SME base. So while we have a great program uh, through the MEP, it's a highly effective program, again, as you'll see, given what other countries are doing, it's pretty clear that we're under-investing in that, and that if we could do more there, we would help our SME base. So I'm going to turn this over to Stephen, who's going to walk us through uh, the report, and then we'll uh, get reactions. Thank you. All right, my colleague Catherine will bring up our presentation here shortly. Great, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Rob. And good morning, everyone. So today I would like to share findings from our report on international benchmarking of countries' policies and programs supporting SME manufacturers. And uh, my presentation will provide an overview of the report. We'll look at why countries put policies and programs in place to support their SME manufacturers, and then provide a summary of findings from the report. So the way we structured the report was to look primarily at programs around the world that were analogous to the U.S. Manufacturing Extension Partnership. These types of programs are called Manufacturing Extension Services, and in addition to the one in the United States, you'll find others around the world, such as the Manufacturing Advisory Service in England, the Industrial Research Assistance Program from Canada that Rob mentioned. Uh, Japan has uh, what are called Public Industrial Technology Research Institutes, or Koshisutu Centers. Uh, other countries, such as uh, Spain uh, and Argentina, have similar programs. Uh, Germany doesn't have a precise analog to the MEP, 
but we looked at their Fraunhofer Institutes and their Stein by Centers, which provide similar supports to their SME manufacturers. What countries manufacturing extension services are ultimately designed to do is to improve the productivity, innovation, and competitiveness capacity of the SME manufacturers in their country. And they do so by providing a range of services that we might classify into four categories. First are what I would call the classic manufacturing extension service programs. Uh, these are technology acceleration programs and practices uh, that seek to um, promote technology adoption and uptake by SME manufacturers. Uh, they're particularly concerned with addressing uh, uh, the transfer of technologies coming out of the country's national laboratories and universities and research institutions and placing them into the hands of the SMEs. Um, one particular aspect of programs in countries like the United States and England is that they engage trusted business advisors who work hands-on with SMEs to improve their manufacturing and process te techniques. In both the US and the UK, uh, uh, the manufacturing extension services will do what's called workouts with their SMEs. They'll engage them hands-on, go visit their uh, location, uh, and suggest to the SME opportunities to improve uh, their processes and operations uh, on the shop floor. Uh, how can you apply lean techniques to your manufacturing processes? How can you apply lean techniques across the entire organization? So these are trusted business relationships that are improving the innovation and competitiveness uh, skills of SMEs. <coughs> A second type of service that countries provide to their SMEs we might call technology acceleration funding mechanisms. And these generally come in two buckets. Uh, the first is direct funding for an SME's innovation and research and development activities. Uh, this has become increasingly popular in countries such as Canada, Japan, Korea, China, Austria, and Germany, who are providing direct funding for the innovation activities of their SME manufacturers. For example, Canada's program uh, provides on average $110,000 to $115,000 in innovation support for SMEs innovation activities, including R&D, technical feasibility studies, prototyping, process development, and exploiting licensed technologies. So they're getting in there and they're providing the funds that the SME, SMEs need to innovate. Um, innovation vouchers are increasingly popular around the world in countries like Austria, Holland, Canada, Germany. Uh, these are typically smaller uh, vouchers uh, from maybe you know five to three thousand euros, and what these vouchers do is enable SMEs to go out and uh, uh, acquire services uh, that help them understand how to implement new innovation methodologies, innovation techniques in their organization. They're much more about teaching innovation skills to companies. Um, loans to SMEs are becoming increasingly common around the world. Uh, this is distinguished from the direct grants for R&D because these types of loans are done to help SMEs scale their businesses uh, or to uh, introduce new operations, new plants into other countries of the world. Um, a third category we might call uh, next generation manufacturing technical assistance. So the key point here is that historically these types of manufacturing extension services as I said, we're focused on uh, quality, lean, Six Sigma, improving the manufacturing and operational capacity of SMEs. But now they're moving to a next level, focused really on helping SMEs directly innovate new products, commercialize new technologies, and focus on the growth side of their business, as opposed to the cost side of their business. And in countries around the world, there's an increasing tier of support being provided to help them uh, uh, find new export opportunities around the world, uh, to teach them how to understand the needs of customers in foreign marketplaces and cater to them, helping them with understanding uh, ever-evolving global technical standards in different marketplaces, uh, teaching them energy-efficient manufacturing processes, or explaining uh, how the role of design is increasingly important uh, in building uh, and manufacturing attractive products to consumers. So putting those types of services together, the message is that, in sum, manufacturing extension services are becoming the central delivery hub of SME support services in countries around the world. So why do countries provide these types of supports to their SME manufacturers? Um, well, the first and key reason is because SME's competitiveness impacts the health of broader industrial ecosystems and national competitiveness, economic growth, 
and job creation. In almost all countries studied in the report, 98% or more of the country's manufacturers are SMEs. So if your SME manufacturers are not healthy, you're not going to have healthy industrial ecosystems and successful industrial supply chains. Unfortunately, a large productivity gap exists between large and SME manufacturers. This gap is apparent and in all countries and has, in fact, been growing over time. In fact, we can look at the amount of value added per employee in US manufacturers between 1967 and 2007 and see this widening gap in terms of the value added per employees uh, between large and small manufacturers. Uh, in fact, the gap has grown from about a $50,000 gap in 1967 to about a $250,000 gap today. Uh, so this gap is widening and it's apparent in all countries. So, you know, why is this the case? Well, uh, it's because SMEs generally tend to underinvest in adopting new technologies that would make them more productive. Um, they have less resources. Uh, they tend to lack information networks or technical skills. Uh, they just have less capability uh, to invest in new capital equipment and machinery. Uh, they lack the types of resources and the skill that larger manufacturers do to make these investments. And part of the problem is that uh, there are actually market failures that exist around the provision of information and advisory services to SMEs. One might be inclined to say, well, if these types of services are so valuable, why doesn't the private marketplace provide them? And there are two answers to that question. Um, first, in a number of countries, uh, the limited ability of SMEs to afford these services uh, precludes the ability of private sector providers to provide these services uh, in a way that they can generate significant uh, financial returns to themselves to make it worth their while. So there's not a sufficient market in a number of countries to provide these types of services to SMEs. But there's actually a more subtle part of the problem, and that is that uh, SMEs in general uh, often uh, lack the ability to properly evaluate the value of these types of services. Uh, they don't have the resources to uh, go out in the entire world and understand what are the types of manufacturing supports that private sectors could provide to them. So what manufacturing extension services do is by coming in and doing these engagements with a firm, uh, they prove to SMEs the value of these services. And what ultimately happens is that manufacturing extension services actually uh, encourage tryouts and ultimately uh, they perform a market making function uh, by showing SMEs the value of these types of consultative services that can improve their productivity and innovation competitiveness. Okay, so what are the key summary findings from the report? Um, the first one is that SME manufacturing support programs achieve substantial economic returns in almost all countries studied. Uh, in fact, when we look at the return on $1 invested in manufacturing extension services, we find quite substantial numbers. Uh, in the United States, $1 of federal investment uh, translates into $32 of economic return. Uh, in Canada, the gross value added on $1 of investment is 12 to 1. And we can look at specific uh, locations within the nine manufacturing advisory services in England and find that the mass northeast location in uh, the United Kingdom uh, generates returns of 30 to 1 on government investment uh, in SME services. Um, so these are quite substantial numbers. In fact, the federal investment in MEP uh, in 2009 uh, created or retained 70,000 US jobs and translated into $3.6 billion in total new sales uh, for US manufacturers. Uh, we see this in other countries. A study of the Canadian Industrial Research Assistance Program found that a 1% increase in IRAP assistance to SMEs led to a 12% increase in a firm productivity, an 11% increase in sales, and a 14% increase in employment. So these types of programs are positively impacting SMEs' ability to increase their productivity, to increase their sales, and that results in employment growth in these companies. Another key point is that the additionality of these services is very high. A study in the United Kingdom found that up to 90% of the workouts that MAS did with its SMEs would not have happened if it wasn't for the MAS. So these are adding new value in the marketplace. Unfortunately, 
what we find, as Rob mentioned, is that a number of competitors are out investing the United States in their manufacturing extension support programs. Uh, this chart shows that as a share of GDP, Japan is investing 30 times more in its SME support programs. Canada is investing 10 times more than the United States as a share of GDP. Uh, Germany somewhere in the middle at about 20 times more. Um, so it's quite apparent that our foreign competitors are investing more in their SME manufacturing support programs than the United States is. But in fact, the United States itself is not investing to the level that it once did. When examined as a share of GDP, the US government actually invested 1.3 times more in MEP in 1998 than it did in 2009. So our funding is declining both relatively against historical norms in the US and then also uh, we're behind our peers. The third key finding from the report, as I mentioned earlier, is that many programs are expanding their focus from manufacturing process and quality to include a focus on innovation and R&D. If you look at how Japan does this, their Kosyosuchi centers are engaging their SMEs and actually co-performing research and development and innovation activities alongside the SME firms. Uh, they're getting uh, researchers and scientists from SMEs into the Kosyosuchi centers to work on commonly shared uh, manufacturing problems in particular industries. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, they're specifically funding the innovation activities of their SMEs. Uh, for, example, can uh, for example, Canada uh, provides $100,000 to $200,000 uh, uh, in grants that SMEs can apply for and has set aside a $15 billion fund uh, to support the R&D efforts of its SMEs. You know, I think what you really find about countries' programs is that the best ones are responsive to where the SME manufacturers in their economy stand, and they seek them to take them to the next level. So what this chart shows you is the composition of countries' manufacturing sectors by technological intensity. Now that's defined by the OECD as uh, essentially uh, their global R&D expenditures as a percent of the sales in these types of industries. Uh, and it classifies the, them between low technology, medium to low technology, medium to high technology, and high technology. And the key point here is when you look at countries like Germany or Japan, Germany has 45% of its manufacturing base in these medium to high technology sectors. Japan has 35%. Uh, the US and the UK have about 20%. In fact, what you see is that in the US and the UK, uh, as much as 60% of our manufacturing base can be characterized in low technology, I mean, the medium to low technology sectors. So the key message of this chart for policymakers is number one, uh, that the United States needs to migrate our manufacturing base up into these higher technological intensity areas. But it also suggests that we can examine what countries like Germany and Japan are doing to win in that key segment of the marketplace. And the way they're doing that is that they are enrolling their SMEs into pre-competitive industrial, industrial relevant research consortia. And a particular way they're doing that, for example, in Germany, is through these 57 Fraunhofer Institutes, which are focused on key vertical technology areas, such as factory automation, wireless sensors, uh, advanced machining, robotics, uh, micro electrical mechanical systems. And they're enrolling these SMEs into these wider inner firm networks that are doing advanced pre-competitive industrial relevant research and then driving that into the manufacturing firms throughout their economy. Now a key point to understand this framing is this um, movement, if you will, between fundamental research, what we might call basic research or basic science, uh, and then moves up the chain uh, to applied research, to development, uh, to technical, technical prototypes and, and, and pilot plants. The key point here is where Germany excels is in this middle layer where they're engaging public-private partnerships that are co-funded by government, by universities, and by businesses to perform industrial relevant applied research of direct relevance to manufacturers' challenges. They recognize the importance of doing this as a partnership with their businesses, and so government and industry come together and co-invest to, to solve common manufacturing challenges. A key point also is that Germany sees its strategy as infusing cutting-edge technology into legacy industries. 
So it sees its advantage as taking once legacy industries like textiles or steel or materials or electrical appliances and using these consortium to feed advanced technology into their companies in these industries so they can move up the value chain to higher technological intensity. So what then overall are the implications for policymakers from these findings? First, as Rod said, manufacturing and SME manufacturing in particular is absolutely vital to an economy's vitality. Manufacturing extension services in the United States and in countries around the world play an indispensable role in supporting the competitiveness, productivity, and innovation capacity of their SME manufacturers. Third, relative to funding levels, their economic impact is positive and substantial. The leading countries see manufacturing extension programs as a core part of their national manufacturing strategy. They provide substantial resources and they recognize it's a core part of their overall national competitiveness. And really the key point here is that countries that do not have strategies in place to support their SME manufacturers are simply going to be left behind in the future. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you, Stephen. Um, it also is a good segue into a commercial for our event in October. We just can't get enough of this stuff, so uh, we're doing an event uh, co-sponsored with the German embassy, uh, drilling down into the Fraunhofer system. We'll have some folks from the Fraunhofer system here, so that event's on our webpage if you're interested in it. I should also mention that the slides here will be up on our website later today if folks want to, if you, you want to get more details. Uh, I'm going to turn it over and actually to Jason. Uh, maybe you can. Uh, we heard a little bit here, Jason, in the presentation about, about IRAP. Um, I don't know if you want to just react to what you heard and what's in the report and your own thoughts about how Canada is doing this. Oh, perfect. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you all and, of course, uh, your patience with having me there virtually. Um, what I what I can say is certainly uh, I did appreciate a lot of what I heard in the presentation it's very consistent about with what the thinking is here in our industry uh, uh, policy groups and uh, in fact I learned some additional things here that I'll come back uh, with but what I can do is I, I, I just want to keep my presentation very short uh, so that we can move to some um, some questions if you'd like uh, and uh, in fact maybe I could just share the details of the presentation later for, for reference uh, I'm going to try to share my desktop here See if I can do that. Perfect. It works. Perfect. Okay. Um, so maybe I could just give you a bit of the overview of IRAP and a little bit of where we're going. So uh, what I certainly wanted to say here is that uh, IRAP is an organization we've been around uh, for uh, for decades now. Uh, the programs that evolved out of the National Research Council uh, are um, our National Research Technology uh, Organization. Uh, so we're part one institute of 20, uh, focusing on everything from aerospace to construction, et cetera. But IRAP is the only contribution, a rent contribution uh, organization within NRC. Uh, the, the advantage we have here is that we're, we're integrated right within an R&D organization. We share a lot of the expertise with our, our, fellow, IDA, our fellow institutes, but also uh, we're able to leverage um, the uh, the council's um, expertise for the better and fit of our, our SMEs. Um, really what we, we think we do, although uh, oftentimes, and, and Stevens talk about it, there, there could be some tunnel vision that occurs, um, oftentimes we're seen as a grant, a grant and contribution organization, so a, uh, an organization that, um, um, that invests financially within our SMEs. But we feel our real value proposition is the trusted relationships we have uh, with these organizations and how we help them build their networks and, uh, and able to build these collaborations at the local levels and, and internationally. Um, so just a little bit about what an RC is. Uh, so we uh, traditionally have helped firms to develop and adopt uh, uh, technologies incorporate them to be in their uh, products and services. So really what we're trying to do is stimulate innovation within their, uh, their products and services so that they can build capacity. And that's been our traditional role, I think, until uh, very recently. Um, and, uh, and what we sort of look like, we, uh, if you know Canada at all, we, we are a sort of a, 
a large but thinly uh, sliced uh, country where a lot of our manufacturing is in fact in Ontario. And that's very much represented in, within our, the organizations we do support. As you can tell, Ontario and Quebec, for example, uh, represent probably about half of our, uh, uh, of our uh, activities, more than half. Uh, we have about uh, 400 employees in IRAP. Of those, uh, a good two-thirds of them are what, we, uh, what our ITAs are, our industrial technical advisors. They are co-located in about 140, 150 companies within Canada. Uh, so uh, really, it's that their 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 uh, their involvement and integration within the community is is quite high. So where do we uh, we, uh, we play? Is really when we look at a lot of the uh, the sectors that we we are in, we really do try to focus our effort in uh, these areas. Uh, you know, the the first one is a little bit uh, ICT is a little misnomer because, of course, uh, we when we've also heard about the integration of ICT technologies within our manufacturing base is critical to the improvement of productivity, and therefore splitting it out is quite difficult. You you probably could could you could uh, collapse that into the rest of our sectors, and you would find that uh, those the projects in in those areas uh, are uh, ICT related as well. So um, I can maybe skip over this because Stephen's talked a lot about this, but uh, the uh, SME community, uh, certainly in Canada as well, is similar to around the world. That, I mean, it's, it's 98%, 99% of our companies. Uh, many of them are very, very small, and uh, they tend to be the areas where there's a lack of, uh, of uh, technology adoption for the purpose of improved productivity. But really, when we look at what the issues are, is sort of access to capital, uh, ability to identi identify technical solutions or business solutions, as Stephen uh, uh, suggested. Uh, there is a lot of uncertainty and risk uh, uh, in, in inherent in their business, um, and it's really quite difficult for them to attract technical or, or specialized or experienced staff. Um, the, the list sort of goes on if you, if you want. They, they're looking to really validate new technologies. They, they're not very aware of the programs that might be available to them to some support of them. Uh, they, they don't have the uh, necessarily the, the global reach. Uh, they don't have the competitive technical intelligence that required to, uh, to make investments in an intelligent manner. Uh, really, when we, we find in some of our interactions with our, our SMEs, is, SMEs, is that uh, we find that sometimes they're or management or governance issues within the organization, and our engagement is uh, is instrumental in helping them develop their their own governance. That could include just the fact that we we are uh, we do pay contributions so on real expenditures, and so when we ask for time uh, time uh, accounting, for example, sometimes this prom uh, prompts the organization to actually uh, start measuring times, for example. Um, and, and really, it's about their, their, their reach. So how do we sort of uh, we, uh, we support uh, the, this, this issue? Is of course, uh, we, we do have funding. We, do, uh, we don't seek to cover all costs of a project. We want to make sure that our, our partners have skin in the game, if you will, and so that uh, we do uh, do cost sharing. Uh, for mostly the labor components, we, we, IREP does not have a mandate to cover uh, the actual um, purchase of equipment, uh, but we're really, uh, we, we support the uh, development of that uh, technology. We, we do have uh, uh, a network of ITAs who also have a network of clients, so really what we try to do is link um, our SMEs whenever uh, we can to other uh, funding organizations, either venture capital or also organizations like uh, uh, BDC, Bank Development Canada, for example. Uh, we do have technical and business expertise in our ITA, so that we, our ITAs do spend a lot of time with our SMEs and do support them. And this could include uh, preparing IP plans, strategic marketing, competitive intelligence plans, uh, and uh, linking our SMEs to our partners either directly or through our, um, our contributions to organizations that I could talk about. Oh, I'm going backwards. So, where we're, where we're heading here is so really what we think is a program, of course, it, it comes to the money. The money is important to, the, the, uh, to invest. Uh, we are coming out of, uh, in Canada, our stimulus program where we, we, we did funnel um, uh, 
we doubled our contributions for two years to SMEs, and, but we're coming to the tail end of that. What's, what we do have, though, is, is the quality and, uh, and uh, dedication of our ITAs. So really, that's the advantage. I mean, uh, no other organization in Canada has that kind of uh, reach, that depth. Whenever we need to um, respond to a government priority in one area or another, we do have uh, sector teams that are able to form very rapidly and engage um, our, uh, our, uh, our SMEs uh, quickly. For, there's a bit of an example here. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has um, been investing in technologies and vaccine technologies for, uh, against uh, the chronic cure for AIDS. And uh, over a co couple of uh, months, there were some struggles about how we invest those funds uh, appropriately. But within a matter of days to a couple of weeks, uh, IRAP was able to identify SMEs who are uh, working in that area and, and make those connections with, uh, with uh, the, that government initiative uh, in partnership with the, the foundation. Drew, maybe just a few more minutes if you can. Yes, fair enough. Um, so why don't I just sort of move forward here and say really we, we do uh, provide um, uh, funding to for uh, R&D projects. We do uh, support uh, the, um, the integration of recent graduates into uh, organizations by paying uh, up to $30,000 uh, $30, of their salary in their first year of employment. And we do make contributions to organizations. Those organizations, like the Canadian Manufacturing uh, Association, uh, do, um, uh, Canadian Manufacturers Exporters do provide uh, training and networking opportunities for SMEs, and these are uh, partner organizations. Um, some of the statistics uh, uh, Stephen's already talked about, so I'll, I'll just pass over them. But um, really, when we talk about the impact factors or the, the return on investments, the 1 to 12, 1 to 30, we, could all, we, we know that some of the, the way those are measured are, can be different from one organization, one uh, country or the other. But I think a real takeaway here is there is a positive return on investment. And it's a worthwhile activity that could take place, and these uh, returns can be uh, quite positive. I, I think the the challenge that uh, the government of Canada <coughs> respond to at this point is the real need to increase productivity, if you will, in our SME communities, as such as Stephen has suggested. And we are launching a new program called the Technology Digital Technology Adoption Program. It's a pilot. But uh, what we are going to uh, seek to do is, is uh, invest in um, the adoption of ICT technologies in manufacturing organizations uh, to enhance and promote the, um, the, uh, their productivities. It's not just about the technology. Uh, what we will like to support is ensuring that the organization is ready to accept this, uh, this, these productivity enhancing tools and that they're well integrated in their processes and uh, that we support uh, both the, the management and, and employees adoption and, and training on these equipment. So it's not about just buying and product and uh, technology enhancing tools, but how to integrate them within the work. That's our challenge uh, for this year. Great. Well, thank you. Um, and uh, please stay on. We'll have a, uh, I'm sure there'll be a bunch of questions and discussion. Uh, we can, Steve, get the lights on, please. Uh, so uh, turn over to Drew. And, um, Super. There's a mic there for you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Drew Greenblatt. I'm the owner of Marlin Steel. Uh, we were established in uh, 1968. I bought the company in 1998. Uh, when you started, Rob, you mentioned the fact that Manufacturing Matters, a book you read, uh, it, it is the real deal. Uh, the average manufacturing employee makes $73,000 a year. That does not include benefits. Benefits are in addition to that. In, in my company, uh, we have Blue Cross Blue Shield, holiday, vacation. Um, we pay 100% if they go back to college uh, or so get an associate's degree or get a master's degree. They have to get a good grade. They can't take basket weaving or anything like that. But uh, these are the kinds of benefits that are pretty commonplace, and, and of course a 401k plan, uh, that are pretty commonplace in manufacturing. So these are really good jobs. And you don't necessarily have to be a high school graduate or you don't necessarily have to be um, a PhD to get one of these jobs. So these are the kinds of jobs that our country needs and these are the kind of jobs that create a middle class. And this is why this topic is so very important. A um, couple topics. Um, most of the companies, most fact, when people think factories, they think huge smokestack, 5,000 employees. 
that's not really the average American factory. The average American factory is a peanut. 15 employees, 20 employees. Uh, they're not big. They're tiny. And that's where the um, MEP really helps because it's focused in on the little guy. And the little guy, it, there's a lot of us. And if each one of us were to hire a handful of employees, two, three employees, recession's going to be over. So that's why this topic is so very important. Um, we make everything in the USA, in Baltimore City. We're in a rough section of town. And uh, we uh, export to 35 countries. And uh, most proud of that we export to China and Taiwan. Uh, but we also export to Singapore, New Zealand. Um, my salesmen were up late last night negotiating a big deal with Australia. Um, exports are critical, and it's very important. Uh, President Obama came out with an initiative a year ago that he wants to double exports in the next five years. Uh, connecti connecting the dots for a little company with 15 employees, 20 employees, that's a great place for an MEP to help uh, because an MEP can explain the value of exporting and uh, making President Obama's vision a reality. Um, Got to remember, 95% of America uh, of the world's consumers are outside our shores. Only 5% are Americans, so it's a huge market we have to pursue. Most uh, American factories don't export, or they may export to one country, maybe two. But they don't export to many. Um, I thought Stephen did a wonderful job with this report. Uh, on page 16, there was a really uh, neat slide describing uh, value added per employee. That's really important for factories. Um, we're, for, for the little guy, uh, we've got about 120, 150 grand in value added per employee. That's a very important number, okay? That's the juice that lets us reinvest, okay? Whether it's a new robot, a quality system, a marketing campaign, you know, adding Blue Cross Blue Shield rather than, you know, a, a lesser quality plan. That's where, this, uh, where the rubber meets the road. If we can boost that number up, then we'll have uh, more funds, we can be more resilient, and we'll be more aggressive in hiring more people. In my case, um, when I bought the company, we sold bagel baskets uh, in 1998. And it was a good business for 30 years. Uh, the company thrived doing that. And it was uh, a, a tremendous blow to me and my company when uh, two things occurred. Uh, China figured out how to commoditize bagel baskets which is a very bad place to be because they were bringing in bagel baskets into Manhattan for cheaper than I could buy steel. Uh, that makes for a very bad market proposition. Uh, we were getting killed by the Chinese. Second thing that happened, I don't know if you recall this time, there was a fad diet called the Atkins diet. And that's the last place you want to position your business to be in, if you're a ba the world's biggest bagel basket manufacturer. So we were devastated and we had to transform. And I think this is a little bit what, again, back to Stephen's report, where we were in that low end uh, commodity portion of the world where you rank the four different levels of technology. We were in the very bottom <laughs> bracket there and making bagel baskets by hand, welding one at a time. Every, the day I bought the company, everybody was minimum wage. The health insurance plan was you go to the emergency room. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was no retirement. Um, nobody owned a car except me. So now we're a very different company. The average employee is making 60, 70 grand a year. Um, where they all have health insurance, they have 401k, etc. So how do you get more companies to make that transformation up? Uh, MEPs could be a catalyst, could be a, a way to enlighten these 15, 20, 30 person companies to get to that next level. But when again, when you look at the, this re report, you see some fascinating things. Now our uh, factory, our manufacturing space is much bigger than Germany. We're bigger than Ch uh, Japan. But on page four, it shows that our MEP program has a mere 1,300 employees. However, in Germany, with a couple of their different groups together, they're 18,000. They have a smaller manufacturing economy than we do. They have you know, more than 12, 14 times the number of boots on the ground than we do meeting with the SMEs. Japan, by the way, is 6,000. Uh, they also have a smaller manufacturing economy. So I, I, that was, that was a, uh, an important thing that, I, that struck me. Um, I think the migration is a, is a good idea. In the past, a lot of MEPs focused on lean manufacturing, continuous improvement. These are good things. These are helpful things. These 
uh, make a factory more competitive, which is what we need. Um, but I think the, the leap or the aspiration to migrate towards more of an innovation approach, more new product development, finding new clients, finding new markets, that approach is very helpful because when you're a 15 person company or a 20 person company, you know, you're running around full steam, you know, trying to make payroll, uh, you know, uh, ordering steel, in my case, ordering steel or, or um, you know, making sure the phone system works, working, make, you know, working with suppliers and clients. There's a lot going on. So slowing down and figuring out, hey, we got to innovate. Hey, slowing down, we got to create a new product so we differentiate ourselves, I think is intrinsic. And this is, again, where MEPs can help. I thought the study was good because it brought... It pinpointed, highlighted several really innovative techniques that other countries are doing that I think we should consider. Um, and I'll go through a couple of them. Page 22 in Germany, the Steinbeis Center. They have a neat program where they transfer the existing know-how in, in, in the education world and in other industries to the little guys. I, I thought that was slick. I mean, like, you take my city, Baltimore City. We have the world's best, many could argue, the world's best medical uh, program. I mean, we have Hopkins. It's, it's a tremendous asset for my city. Unfortunately, I think a lot of Hopkins doctors come up with these really innovative ideas. They get a patent, and then it's made over in China or made, you know, made in Mexico. Okay, well, that's crazy. I mean, if we could make it in Baltimore City, we could hire a lot of unemployed steel workers. Okay, so I think this kind of uh, migration of really smart uh, uh, ideas coming out of, out of our universities, if they can be funneled through our own factories, I think that would be good for our economy. And it sounds like Germany's onto something with that. And I, I thought that was a nice highlight. In page 20, okay, a couple others, the Brandenburg program in page 25, where they place PhDs with various factories for two years and cover 50%. That was a wonderful program. The innovation voucher on page 31, where they talk about co the cooperative project with R&D and technology. Um, over in Canada, the Design Industry Advisory, another good program. Um, the bottom line is I think we have to focus on those, that Mittelstadt, that, what's going on in Germany, where 80% of the production is exported. There's a million workers uh, uh, in Germany, that middle portion of their factory base, 80% of their production is exported because they're so competitive, so innovative. And we have to do more of that. I think, I think my favorite quote in your document is by Dr. Jockel on page 43, where he talks about you know, where we have to go in the future uh, of, of MEPs and, and helping out MS, SMEs. So in summary, um, I think manufacturing extension services are vital for our nation and for our SMEs. And I think the main theme of this report is that other countries are getting serious, and uh, we're behind the game, and we have to do the same uh, in the future. Thank you. Drew, thank you so much. That was great. Okay. Yeah, well, I got slides, so okay. let me slide up here. Okay. Very good. A uh, couple of things while we're getting the slides up. Let me, let me point out that I'd actually recommended Drew to come and participate today, knowing that uh, he's got a very good perspective of where manufacturers ought to be, but also understand he's on the extreme end of the continuum of what our typical small manufacturers are like. He knows what's going on. He's taken advantage of the technologies. He's looked at exports. Our real challenge is, is getting the rest of the SME population in the U.S. to think and act like he does. So I know it's a double-edged sword when I when I sit at a meeting with you as I try to explain the challenges we've got in your here, uh, having already made uh, made many of those changes. Let me um, let me go. I guess briefly through kind of MEP and how we took our policy directive, if you will, we were created back in 88, uh, and we were created to transfer technology out of the federal labs, in particular out of NIST. And let me talk just briefly from this chart, and, and uh, even though I know we've got a strict timekeeper, after the, the comment about being born since before I was at NIST or something, uh, I've only spent, the longest I've ever spent on this one chart is two and a half hours. Okay, so, 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 so you know, yeah. Uh, but we've already talked about m many of the things that have already been mentioned really reflect in the, in, and I do support it. So what I want to talk about is kind of how MEP is a program, and, and I will say uh, 
to my knowledge, it is the only federal program that's explicitly focused on manufacturing and manufacturing in the broadest definition of the, uh, that sense of the entire enterprise uh, within the federal government. Uh, and what we've done to, given that initial policy directive, what we've done to evolve, uh, evolve the program to, to really focus on what the SMEs need. So created in 88, we're about transferring technology out there. We really started uh, about getting centers in place and relying on that local uh, network of experts uh, to be able to go out and deal with small manufacturers. We learned early on the tech push, taking technology out of federal labs or universities and putting it in the hands of small manufacturers was not a good proposition. So we really made a very significant change, subtle somewhat, perhaps if you weren't looking at the internals of it, to really focus on what's the market pull. Working with small companies, helping them to understand what their opportunities were, and then connecting them with the resources to be able to address that. Drew talked a little bit about the lean manufacturing in the 2000s, early 2000s. Certainly the productivity issues that we were facing uh, were where our real focus was. And, and the lean manufacturing uh, fleet uh, collection of services that we produced really resulted in a lot of the impacts that, that you see that are reported in uh, uh, the report in terms of how we can improve the productivity of small manufacturers, eliminating the costs and waste in there. But we realized that at some point you can only squeeze out so much out of an operation and you really need to help companies look at the other side of this, the income side uh, of getting new customers into new markets. But just flat out saying, hey, you now need to go export uh, is, is not a very good answer for a small manufacturer. Uh, I think it's been explained here by a couple of the folks they don't know what they don't know. They need that educational piece. They need the hand-holding to be able to get and identify those opportunities. And you really need to do this in a strategic way. And so in the 2006 and beyond, we started to not only f maintain that lean manufacturing. And the one thing I will say is it is still an important component of what we do as a, as a system. It's still important to the small manufacturers. The transition that's happening is where we were in applying lean to existing processes and products that they were doing in there, we're now using those same approaches as you're developing new products and new processes. So the concepts are still transferable, although we're doing it in, in a slightly different way. So working with the companies in, in a strategic fashion to be able to help them understand what the opportunities are, so we're still kind of meeting their immediate demands with Lean, but helping them to focus on what can you do in terms of, of, of new products, what can you in terms of improving your processes, how do you get out to new markets and the exporting. We've almost come full circle uh, from when we were created uh, in terms of now, what's a big factor in being able to do those things I just mentioned, and that is technology. And technology is a big driver in differentiating companies in terms, of, you know, specifically about their products uh, and what they what they can do with those. It also builds back into uh, their manufacturing processes. Uh, another factor uh, when you're talking about innovation is now let's look at the business model, both internal to the company and how you're structured and operate, but also what are those external partnerships that you can form to really make yourself and distinguish yourself uh, from your competitors. And the last uh, box on there, let, let me mention real quickly, is, is when you look at a manufacturer in, in the enterprise, and that's where our primary focus has been, but look at the environment that they've got to operate in in terms of the community that they're in. Uh, and this really came to surface with uh, a lot of the energy issues, uh, certainly with environmental concerns. Uh, and so when you look at what other organizations that have an influence and, and a factor in that, and, and I'll use the one, we've got a program called E3, uh, that we're partnered with a, a number of federal agencies, to look at a community-based, how do you deal with the energy costs, well certainly you need to have the utility involved. How do you deal with water and sewage things? You need to have the local community involved. How do you deal with the manufacturer that's operating in that environment? How do you deal with the other suppliers? How do you deal with the OEM that's above it? And really have taken much more of a community-based approach to structure things so that people can, can one, the manuf our focus is still the manufacturer, but there's so many other impacts where the utility really appreciates this because now they've got a better sense of uh, where uh, their demand is going to be and controlling that demand and, and planning their expansion helps. Certainly helps likewise with the local communities and water and sewage. 
So we've expanded uh, beyond just the individual company, but to look at it much more from a community, regional, economic development perspective. Um, I've got the clock put in front of me already, so let me switch to the chart. Let me explain from here. This is much more the U.S. system, if you will, of, of how we're structured with the technology. And as I said, we're now back into to really focusing how do we get technology into the hands of small manufacturers. If you look over on the right-hand side, the blue area, that's been the historically where MEP has functioned uh, in terms of dealing with manufacturers, having to understand their processes, uh, and uh, focused on, on those kinds of productivity improvements. To get to the technology, we've got a whole uh, structure in, in the U.S. With, between universities and federal labs, independent uh, uh, inventors that are creating this technology. But there is this gap. And in, if you're talking about it from a financial perspective, it's, you know, it's the valley of death. But I would say there's even, <laughs> even as critical to that, there's this information gap that the manufacturers really don't understand what's available, how they can use it, and getting access into the, the technology end of this. And so what we've done uh, is to focus on how do, you tr how do you bridge this gap between the technology developers and uh, MEP. If you notice uh, what uh, our Canadian colleagues talked about, and in many other cases, the Fraunhofer's, that's where a lot of their emphasis is. It's in taking that basic research, doing the development, working with companies across that. We don't have a similar structure here in the U.S. And so what we've done is to work through developing partnerships with the folks on the research side, developing tools to be able to, to help bridge and explain that technology. Uh, part of this is scale, so we've developed something called the National Innovation Marketplace, which is, gives us the ability to share that information across our network of centers. Uh, key thing to that is, is it takes the basic science or uh, engineering description of a technology and translates that into what's the potential uh, process or product application. And oh, by the way, also a simple market analysis that says if you do this, this is what your likely, uh, your likely market is and what you're gonna be able to sell, which gets to the reducing the risk, reducing the uncertainty, and giving the, the small manufacturer uh, some sense of, of what's involved in, in being able to, to take and do that. Um, let me see if I can buzz through real quickly then. So we really are about partnerships. So as far as the implementation of this goes, uh, Rob talked about the $300 million program. That really is a cost shared part. We pay, we're a third of that uh, to our centers. And so for us, it really depends on partnering at the federal level and with the centers at the state and local level to bring in all the resources. Because again, you're talking about not just the technology, but for a manufacturer, you need to worry about things related to finance, you need to worry about things related to workforce development, uh, you need to focus on uh, uh, how they do get to exports, et cetera. So it, it is the entire enterprise uh, uh, that we need to be focused on with, with the small manufacturers. For us, uh, how this translates into, we've got centers in, in all 50 states. We've got about 370 locations. Uh, they've got a local brand. One of the big drivers for that is, is they do go out and charge fees for service with the clients they serve. And so that local brand recognition is, is key to, to uh, them dealing with the SMEs in, in, in their area. Um, and this kind of gets at the, the, the uh, how we leverage our uh, assets here. So if I go from NIST and my staff of about 45 people who are working primarily on the partnering and developing tools and services for the network through our 60 centers, 370 uh, service locations, 1,300 to 1,400 uh, staff in the field, but then start looking at, we use over 2,300 service providers. That's not people, that's organizations to be able to leverage to, again, our focus is primarily on the small and medium-sized goals. All right, well, thank you. And um, before I open up, I just want, I think one question one might have after listening to all of that is, uh, you know, why, why is it in our interest nationally to have Drew go from making bagel baskets to making much more complex steel wire products? Why don't we just, you know, 
who cares? Let's the market work that out. Uh, <clears throat> somebody else will figure out what to do. And, you know, it's like, thank you for doing that. But why do we care? And I think the answer to that fundamentally why we care is that, yeah, the market will figure that out. Somebody else will end up doing that. They just won't be in America. And if our interest is the global economy and we're just all we're out is to maximize everybody else, then we shouldn't be doing this. But if our interest is to say we think that a healthy American manufacturing base is important, then it does matter because we can't be indifferent to the transition that Drew went through. It's in our national interest to have Drew replicated 338,000 more times, I guess. So it's not too hard to do that, right? So why don't we open it up? Uh, we've got about 25 minutes, uh, 20 minutes for comments or questions. Do you want to quickly uh, identify yourself? And uh, go ahead. Um, I'm Mitzi Wertheim with the Naval Postgraduate School, but I spent 13 years at IBM, and I was working on manufacturing issues back in the early 80s when IBM decided to shift from being a manufacturing firm to a service economy. And my question is always, so where are the jobs? But I wanted to ask you here, in listening to um, what Drew was saying and, and what Roger was saying, about the whole question of people working together and collaborating. And the dilemma in our educational system is you learn your specialty. There's nothing in, in the educational system that gets you to work and learn horizontal. And the reward system is all in a stovepipe mechanism. So moving from a stovepipe world into a world where you have to reach out and learn how to work with others, I think is a very key piece of this. And I don't see schools doing it. I, I, I will just add to this. I I, great. Thank you. OK. okay. Um, I don't know, Drew, you want to jump on that? Sure. Um, we have been aggressively hiring mechanical engineers. A third of my employees are mechanical engineers now. And uh, we're hiring recent graduates at the University of Maryland. And I'm, one thing I was stunned about is how collaborative they like to work. And they like to work in teams. And this is something new that at least <coughs> University of Maryland is doing. I don't know if this is nationwide, but this is certainly something going on there. Regarding uh, our employee culture in addition, one thing we do is we have lean manufacturing cells which are, are around different robots and the crew has to make a certain number of baskets or sheet metal fabrications per week and if they do they get a check so they work very collaboratively because they all get a check if they hit their bogey and if they don't they don't they get no money so they self-police themselves regarding coffee breaks bathroom breaks we don't care if you take a smoke break it's on you just hit your numbers at the end of the week so it's, you, we work very collaboratively. And, but and you're really special. Actually, let, let's leave that because I want, I want to be able to move on. So, because uh, we got a lot of folks having questions. Uh, we'll go in order. I saw him. Ken. Um, Ken Jarbo with Athena Alliance. My question is for Jason. Uh, two of the new wave areas that you seem to be getting into, uh, you get elaborated very much. One was what Drew talked about, about the uh, design advisory system. How's that working out, and how, how do you get design thinking embedded into your uh, SMEs? And the other is you, you had a little phrase on your slide about um, supporting IP plans for small and medium-sized enterprise, which it seems to me is a was on the strategic side, not simply on the tech transfer side. So could you explain how that's working as well? Uh, sure. Um, maybe uh, uh, certainly for the uh, the technology advisors and the uh, and on the design side. So we, we we do have some expertise in that area. We have worked with organizations to on lean manufacturing, everything that was mentioned before. But we do understand that this is an area that we need to develop more in. In fact, uh, we have a we have a poster up for staffing, if you will, for ten new uh, what we're calling. Uh, technology adoption uh, specialists that, to support that activity precisely uh, within IRAP. I mean, there, this expertise exists elsewhere in, um, in, in Canada and through other organizations, but we think it's precisely in that kind of skill set we need to, to support the development of uh, technologies in this area. Um, and when it comes to IP plans, uh, we, we either do that internally, we, we actually have some expertise here at NRC and within I, uh, IRAP as well, uh, but we also uh, use um, uh, uh, other organizations, either through a contribution to organization or through direct uh, procurement uh, to support that. So what we're finding is, and, and you're probably suspecting as well, is that there is a real gap in not 
you know, sort of like a tunnel on the products, tunnel on on the actual uh, technology solution, but not a good sense of how this all fits and whether or not investment in these areas are worthwhile. And so uh, what we we try to support not only that project, but how it fits within the scope of their uh, their organization. Great, Roger. Yeah, you hit on a really good point. We're working with the Patent and Trade Office to actually develop an uh, an assessment, an IP assessment and management tool for small manufacturers because they don't even realize what the heck they've got their hands on. Uh, so that's something we're going to be rolling out uh, by the end of this calendar year. Okay. And also, page thirty-two of the report talks about the UK's designing demand program, which uh, provides eighty percent of expenses for SMEs to engage a mentor. Uh, to help them make strategic design decisions and uh, set up and manage design projects. I'm going to take him in order. I've seen him, so Bob. Uh, Bob Boff from the AFL-CIO. I just want to thank uh, Roger for your many years of persistence <laughs> and hanging in there to help create and move an MVP system in the United States. And ITIF, for your particular uh, focus on manufacturing, it's been very helpful to work you do, Rob, uh, uh, to everybody. I guess my question is, uh, for our Canadian colleague and for Roger and for Rob, um, the study did a great job of sort of highlighting the differences in the investment levels and the things they focus on. I guess when I look at that, I step back and I say, well, what are the drivers in Germany and, J and Japan in particular, given the wide difference in that, of those countries in, in particular, that have enabled them to move ahead systematically and focus on this and create these systems and do this? You know, what is it we've been lacking uh, that allows us to have that breadth and depth of focus. I mean, uh, we've noticed the differences, but what did you observe in your study that sort of said, what's the impetus behind a national policy around these things? Well, a couple of things. One of the most interesting things about Japan is that they have this amazing set of centers. And then you go in there, and there's engineers, and they're testing equipment. I mean, they're really amazing. And, and, and as Stephen said, they're, they're big. Uh, they don't get any federal money which is really surprising. It's all prefecture money or you know, states, if you will. And, and the question is, why do they do that? And the answer is because their culture does not allow industrial smokestack chasing. So they just don't do it. It's, not, it's seen as you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't, if you're one prefecture, you wouldn't go and try to steal the Toyota plant from another prefecture. It's just not done in, in Japan. And so the only way these prefectures can grow is through what you would call grow, grow from within, is help your existing companies become more dynamic, help new manufacturers form. So their entire sort of political economy forces them to into the space. At the state level, and I know this quite well, as I worked for a governor doing economic development, you know, the easy path of the states is, let's just go out, dangle a bunch of money, convince a company to move here, and the country does not benefit at all from that. Just, just moving a job from one place to the next. And so that's the, in, in Germany, I think the answer, and it's similar also in Japan, is they don't really have this, this sort of market ideology. But they, they understand that markets work when they're supplemented by smart public-private partnerships. And so there's no sort of, there's no ideological fight in these countries. Well, we should just leave it up to the market. We, you know, Drew either fails or succeeds on his own, and that's the right way to do it. So I think, you know, I think... The last point also is that those countries see themselves in intense competition. We don't. We see ourselves as dominant. We don't really think we ultimately have to trade. We can sort of sell to Mississippi or sell to Michigan or whatever. So I think they, are, see, they see themselves in a much more realistic way and they realize if we don't do this, we are just simply going to be losing. Now I think a lot of those factors are changing for the positive in the U.S., so I'm hopeful that we can, we can move forward. I don't know if anybody wants to add to that, but... Okay. Chuck. Yeah, you know, I would actually <coughs> join uh, uh, our colleague here in thanking you for pushing on this uh, agenda. It's really, it's really important that we, that we know. I had a couple of quick uh, sort of actual questions. One on the Fraunhofer. Uh, Steve, I think it's an important thing to keep in mind that when we're comparing these is that Fraunhofer puts a lot of money into really large companies. Uh, French observers would smile and say, well, maybe it's a way of getting past the commission rule on the state aids. Uh, so there, there's a whole other dimension there. And I go back to Roger. What is, I, I should know this, but what is the max size you get on the aid MEP can give? Because we, we tend, in my view, to have these very artificial right. distinctions. <clears throat> and, and not to ignore our fellow on the screen, uh, Jason, the... Uh, uh, let me ask you just a real tough cross-border question. 
IRF is great. Everybody in Canada tells me it's great, and your funding is going back down, and it hasn't been increased despite all that you're saying. And you don't have the money in a program like SBIR to follow up and push these things uh, more towards the private markets. You've been frozen there for a long time. And this is a real friendly but tough question. So what's the problem? If it works, why don't you put any money in? So why don't you take that one first, and then we'll go with Roger. I, I love the question because he keeps saying the same thing, right? So uh, what we tend to have is some very strong performance measures, some str uh, strong community uh, support for the program, and then, so of course, where's the money? It, it does come back to the issue that, comes, that often occurs, is that, um, well, in fact, uh, we're not, we're, it's not just about the contributions. But I'll, I'll put that aside and say, okay, so contributions are important, and, and why, are, why is the funding not increased? Uh, of course, we're in a uh, deficit reduction action program within in Canada as well, where we have a deficit and, and there's some spending constraints. But that being said, we're very confident in the last budget there was an announcement for an $8 million program, technology, a digital technology adoption program that's, that, uh, that we, have, we hope to be able to announce in a, in a matter of weeks. And there's uh, some real uh, buzz around uh, increasing our, our funding levels. But overall, Canada has a bit of a structural problem in how we support R&D. We do a lot more in, uh, indirect investment or tax breaks than we do direct investments like uh, IRAP. And uh, we're, we're, as an organization and as a, as a country, as through the R&D review that we're conducting now, uh, trying to rebalance that. So we know that we that our current strategy hasn't, uh, hasn't been successful in delivering productivity gains within SMEs. And I think, uh, well, I'll just sort of sell it by saying, uh, uh, you know, stay tuned. I, I think there will be some significant changes within the IRF program and significant investments in the program uh, shortly. Uh, I hope. Great. Thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah. As far as the science, th there actually is no total restriction. Actually, our language says work with manufacturers, especially small and medium sized. And so we use the SBA definition, uh, which is generally 500 uh, employees. Uh, the, well, although we do work with the big guys to really understand their supply chain dynamics, what they need, how the suppliers can better meet that. Uh, and, and so, in fact, we really do work, work more broadly than just that, although the project-based efforts and the service provided are really for the small guys. I want to add one amplifying comment as well to what Chuck said about the Fraunhofer Institutes. Um, I didn't have time to get into it in the presentation, but there are actually uh, two uh, sets of collaborative research programs that exist in Germany, organized both horizontally with regard to specific technologies like factory automation or robotics or advanced machining. There's actually also a vertical set of programs called the Industrial Gemeinschaftsforschung. And these are inter-industry textiles or ceramics or materials uh, where companies in this industry come together, small and large alike, and take these research that's coming out of the Fraunhofer Institutes focused on specific technologies and work on applying those technologies to problems within their industry. So they're getting at the problem both horizontally and vertically, something the Austrians do as well. I just think that's an interesting approach for us to be mindful of. Another program to or point to amplify um, is that both in Canada, in Germany, and Australia, uh, providing additional funding for their SME support programs was a specific target of their stimulus packages. So you heard Jason mentioned the extra 100 million that went in in 2010 and 2011. Same thing in Germany. They put an extra 1.26 billion into supporting their SME manufacturers across 2010 and 2011. Australia did 251 million. So uh, it's your point, but they're funding these things. And probably have time for maybe one last question. Yes, ma'am. I'm interested in the workforce. Um, how are you developing and maintaining a skilled workforce? through apprenticeship and on-site training to keep up with high-tech innovation? Um, we uh, send people to school for the technologies we buy. So, for example, um, we bought a sheet metal punch for our sheet metal fabrication and a sheet metal press break all within the last year. Um, and we sent uh, people... I think it's a total of eight people uh, to Connecticut for over a week uh, to learn to train. Um, we're getting we're going to be getting a laser in October, and uh, we're going to be sending four people to Connecticut for a week for that. 
Um, so we're, we constantly have, any, any particular month, people out of state training. Uh, uh, internally, uh, we um, rent out a room at Catonsville Community College, we're in Baltimore City, and uh, we, ha- we bring in uh, like lean manufacturing uh, gurus or teachers. So that's the kind of stuff we do internally. Um, and uh, we have a big skills matrix in our factory where every single employee is a column and every single skill is a row and every single employee is you know complex robots get four points easy ones get one and we tabulate it and if if you learn a new skill you get more money so everybody has skin in the game and they really want to learn more so there's a lot of cross training um and uh you know so it 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 shows people what we're looking for and what skills we're gunning for can i make one comment yeah go ahead there's an example of a company that keeps the workforce in a strategic way in the planning ahead and what they're doing. Not the norm, just so you understand. Yes, my, my name is Don Yalmashon, and I'm Director General for Swedish Governmental Agency. And I would like to thank you for addressing a very, a very important issue. And I think that the problem is big, but it could perhaps it's not as big as, as you addressed it because when we see the service industries together with the manufacturing industries the outsourcing the supply chain perhaps the statistics are quite difficult to 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 understand i agree about the, the problem but the magnitude perhaps it's a little bit less if you if you include everything that before was a part of, 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 of the manufacturing, but today it's outsourced, it's, it's, it's made in different ways. So we are living in, in, in value chains that, that are quite different, but you have addressed that too. So the question is really important, but maybe the statistics need to be improved. Uh, it's a valid point. Uh, <coughs> let me just say two uh, things. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, the question was how much of the as supply chains have expanded, and companies are sometimes moving services out that they did internally, they're buying services now. That are, are we actually accurately ma- measuring manufacturing health because some of it, the loss could be in now in services that they were doing? So Drew might have had a, an accountant, and now he's using an outside accountant. So he has one less employee. It looks like he's less healthy, but he's exactly the same. I guess I'd say two things. One is uh, I wish I was Sweden because. Uh, uh, at least our data show that Swedish manufacturing is quite healthy, uh, in quite in contrast to America. Uh, it's not to say you don't have challenges in Sweden uh, with some of your big companies that have had a little bit of problems, but overall Swedish manufacturing is doing quite well. Uh, so I wish I was I wish we were Sweden in that regard. Thank you. Uh, not in the weather regard. I mean, <laughs> yeah. In the manufacturing. <laughs> I think it's a warm week, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I actually like Sweden. But I guess the point in the U.S., there have been a number of studies done on this question, and it basically, it's not, it, it is not the explanatory factor. <clears throat> Even when you control for that, there's been still significant output loss. So one of the points we made in the other study, if you look at the 20 NAICS codes, essentially the major industrial sectors in the U.S., uh, and you look at their change in real output adjusted for inflation between 2000 and 2009, uh, 16 of them showed absolute decline. Uh, two of them showed no change, and two of them were complete measurement errors that, in our view, showed no change either. But the BEA, I think, just really does a fundamentally bad job of measuring this. And as a result, I think the BEA is, is really misleading the country in terms of our manufacturing health. Now, not everybody agrees with that, but uh, Susan Houseman at, at uh, Upjohn Institute has done similar work finding that. Dan Lurie at Michigan Manufacturing Technology Center has done similar work. So that, to me, is a pretty critical question. Uh, so I do think it's real in the U.S. And it's, again, uh, you look at a lot of other countries, um, Sweden, Austria, Germany, uh, Japan, Korea, uh, you know, maintaining their manufacturing. Now, one of the things I think that is happening, you see that in, in Germany, in, in, is it's not like they're maintaining and holding on to their to their bagel making. They're maintaining their manufacturing by doing what Drew did. They're just, the problem is that they have many more Drews than we do, uh, and they have many more programs to help. In other words, German manufacturers are not holding on to the to 
sort of low commodity production, that is getting shed to developing countries. What they're then doing is they're trans <coughs> transforming and moving up exactly as, as Drew has done. That's the process we haven't done anywhere near as much in this country. And, and that's why, in our view, a program like the MEP, particularly with its new focus on this technology transition, is so critical if we're going to make that transition. I think on that, we probably need to, need to uh, adjourn. So uh, thank you all for attending. The video will be up later if you want to share it with uh, colleagues or if you just want to watch it again. Uh, I don't know why you would, but you never know. <laughs> uh, and also, I, I want to thank uh, uh, Jason in particular uh, for joining us from Canada and, and Drew for, you know, you have a business to run and, and I appreciate taking the time out to contribute to helping us understand policy better. So thank you and thank you, Roger and Stephen.